Mum House. It was a shocking crime in an area where there was very little or no crime. Two six-year-old boys and three adults were shot dead in cold blood. It was just ridiculously big, the story. It was just almost crazy. Officers believed Sheila Caffell had killed her family and then turned the gun on herself. But the twist that followed thrust this horrific crime into the headlines and turned the focus to her brother, Jeremy Bamber, a name that has gone down in the annals of British crime history. I don't think Britain had heard of a twist like it. And the twist continues. Is the right person behind bars? We look at vital new evidence that opens this case once more and makes this a crime that shook Britain. Three thirty six AM. Chelmsford police in Essex receive a call from a local farmer, Jeremy Bamber, worried for his family's welfare. Jeremy Bamber had apparently received a phone call from his adoptive father to say that his sister, Sheila, Hello? had gone berserk in the house. You've got to come quickly. Dad? And had a gun. Dad, Dad! Jeremy Bamber tried to call back. Um, he could not get through. In his state of anxiety, he wasn't sure, and who would be sure, whether it was engaged or off the hook, whatever, but he couldn't get through. Jeremy phoned the local police station and was advised to go to White House Farm, where he would find police officers waiting for him. The police rushed to the scene, and I think they spent quite a bit of time uh, waiting outside, as you would do if there's been a report of gunshots. Jeremy Bamba worked at his parents' farm, but lived just three miles away in Goldhanger. He arrived at the scene just minutes after the police. A conversation started. The police officers wanted to know about the house, who was in it, and what might be behind uh, the phone call. Bamba explained he had left the farm after work the previous evening. Officers decided not to enter until armed backup was at the scene. Police reinforcements were called and they were briefed. They were told there was a siege situation. Jeremy was asked to sketch a plan of the house for the firearms team. From the conversation with his father, it appeared Sheila, his sister, was threatening the family with a gun. At 7.35 a.m., almost four hours after police initially arrived, armed officers entered the sprawling 18th century farmhouse to be faced with a devastating scene. The father, Neville Bamber, was in the kitchen. He'd been shot there. The twins were in their beds. One certainly had been shot through the head and was still sucking his thumb. We had June out of her bed in the bedroom and Sheila, the adopted daughter, uh, laying there with a rifle, laying across her body with an open Bible alongside her. Sheila Caffell, her twin sons, Nicholas and Daniel, and her parents, Neville and June Bamber, had been brutally murdered. Shot numerous times in cold blood. The only immediate surviving relative remained outside, Jeremy Bamber. Sergeant Jones and uh, DC Clark's job was, in that first instance, family welfare. Jeremy had been warned to expect the worst. We've been all around the place. Five fatalities. He had been driven back from, if you like, the front line of operations and was some hundreds of yards back. When the story was broke to him, he broke down and he cried and he was in a state of traumatic shock. As 24-year-old Jeremy reeled from the devastation of losing his entire family, the crime scene suggested there was no one else involved. Police elicited that Sheila, suffering with mental illness, a few days before had come out of a hospital. Farmer's daughter could handle a firearm. Jeremy Bamber, he'd been shooting rabbits and had left the gun with ammunition and a fully loaded magazine on the kitchen table. So everything was slotting into place to set the scene of her going berserk having access to a gun, picking it up, 
and then shooting everybody, and then shooting herself. There was no doubt in the minds of the majority of the senior police officers that they were dealing with a case of one suicide uh, and four murders. Sheila Caffell was diagnosed as uh, a paranoid schizophrenic. She had a history of mental illness. <laughs> a tragic young woman with severe mental illness had repeatedly shot both her children and parents. News quickly spread through the small village and the national media descended to cover the story. The massacre at White House Farm, it was stated that Sheila Caffell's injuries appeared to be self-inflicted. I was chief reporter on the Evening Gazette at the time of the killings. And the policeman said, well, yeah, what's happened is you know, five people have been found murdered in a farmhouse. You might get one murderer in a year in the Colchester area, and that would be a big deal. But to have so many deaths reported like that, he just couldn't quite take it in, I don't think. The Bamba family were respected members of the community. Neville and June Bamba were very well known in the area. He was a local gentleman farmer. She, very active in the local church. In addition, Neville was a local magistrate on the Whitton bench. They lived in a very, very nice house worth quite a lot of money. You'd look at them and suspect they, they, they appeared sort of salt of the earth, you know, but uh, clearly the same didn't apply to their two adopted children. Jeremy and his older sister, Sheila, had very different reputations to their parents. Sheila embarked on a career in modeling. Uh, initially, she made some progress, and, and, and she did uh, a fair amount. But that seemed to suddenly fizzle out. Jeremy was a good-looking lad, and I think we soon found out that he had a very lively uh, social life. It didn't take long to find out that uh, he liked being out in the town in Colchester, and I think he was a bit of a, a ladies' man. Sheila and Jeremy wanted a greater freedom than their mother was prepared uh, to condone. And I think that is where the trouble started. Friction within the Bamba family soon emerged, but officers needed to delve deeper to uncover a motive behind this horrific crime. <laughs> Meanwhile, Jeremy, the only surviving close relative, was taken home to deal with his loss and piece together events leading up to the murders. Officers learnt that the previous day, Jeremy and his father had worked the land, whilst June took Sheila and the boys into the local village. Jeremy and Neville came back from harvesting. There was some sort of family supper, and they all sat round the kitchen table. And it was that point, according to Jeremy, that the conversation happened, and one element of that was suggesting that Sheila could not quite cope with her children. Sheila Caffell had a history of mental illness and was taking prescribed medication. She had split from her husband and was visiting her parents. Her recent state of mind had given Neville and June cause for concern. It soon became clear that Sheila was a very strange and troubled young woman. It was revealed that she believed her, her sons were the spawn of the devil. She's schizophrenic and uh, she had a lot of issues with uh, religion, which probably stemmed from her mother. Jeremy says that there was tension, quite considerable tension, uh, when he went. After the heated discussion, Jeremy left White House Farm. It was 9.30 p.m. Six hours later, he received a call from his father. You've got to come quickly. Dad? The sleepy village of Tulsant Darcy in Essex has been the scene of horrific multiple murders. Three generations of a family have been shot and killed, including two six-year-old boys. Only one close family member remains, the son, Jeremy Bamber. The police believed there was a siege situation at White House Farm, and that was why the reinforcements were called. It is also why two ambulances were called. Officers waited outside the property for four hours before sending armed response into the farm. From the scene that confronted them, they quickly concluded that Sheila Caffell had murdered her family before killing herself. Detective Inspector Miller arrived after the bodies had been discovered. When I got there, I was quite amazed to find a lot of press people there, and that a press announcement 
had already been made saying that this woman had killed all of her family. That's as much as I knew. And I was instructed to clear things up at the house and prepare a file for the coroner. Just hours after finding the bodies, police took the decision to remove certain items from the house. Crucial evidence was taken and destroyed as officers believed the case was closed. Within 12, 24 hours, there was a general clean-out of White House Farm. And a fair amount was removed, in particular carpets. And one does wonder why, but they were taken out and they were destroyed before any real forensic evidence could be taken from them. The uh, carpets, which would be heavily bloodstained, were, uh, were burned in the grounds of the, uh, the farm. In the immediate aftermath, Jeremy agreed to officers destroying some items from the farm to remove painful memories. It was nothing like as secure as we would have been nowadays for what was a murder scene, uh, where we were still looking for somebody else. That would have been contained uh, obviously a lot better, but the instruction had gone out that it wasn't such a scene and it got not such an in-depth forensic examination. As forensic evidence wasn't a priority, the keys to White House Farm were handed to Jeremy and the extended family just three days later. The relations of the Bambers, one particular woman, Anne, Anne Eaton, I think was a, was a cousin, she had come to the farm to do an inventory with the family solicitors. Jeremy Bamber's cousins, Anne Eaton and David Booflower, and Uncle Robert Booflower, were also farmers who lived nearby. They were keen to safeguard the property in the aftermath of the tragedy. There's sort of a bit of the Miss Marple thing going on there, and they, they obviously went into the house and had their suspicions. The Eatons and the Booflowers made a point of thoroughly searching the farmhouse. What happened next turned the case upside down. And it was shortly prior to the coroner's hearing that a surprising development happened. And they say in the gun cupboard in that downstairs office, they found the uh, silencer and, and other materials. This silencer would fit and would be used with the rifle that we found on the body of Sheila Caffell. And Anne Eaton found it strange that the silencer was not on the gun when we found it, because there was no silencer on the gun when we found it. The weapon that lay with Sheila Caffell was a .22 caliber rifle, a gun used by the family for shooting rabbits. It was able to accommodate a silencer or sound moderator, like the one discovered in the gun cupboard. Once you got out the box, on it, it seemed like some red paint or blood, or both, and a grey hair coming out of it. That had sort of attached itself to it. The family was convinced these items were connected to the murders, so made the decision to remove them from White House Farm. Two days later, police collected the items the cousins had discovered. We were fortunate as an investigating team that Anne Eaton, who was familiar with the house, was able to find that silencer and deliver it to us. Because had we not got that, I'm not so sure that we would have ever had the conversation with Anne Eaton about the rifle that we found not having a silencer on it. This discovery by Anne Eaton and her family changed the whole investigation. Officers said the gun found on Sheila Caffell did not have a silencer on it. If they proved otherwise, she could not have committed the crime. She rang Stone Jones and he went over and collected it and brought it straight over to me, rang me and said, can I come and see you? I've got this silencer. Detective Inspector Bob Miller took possession of the device and sent it for forensic examination. Mildly excited, I have to say, when I saw it, but keeping an open mind and always looking at the negative side of things, said well, it could be blood from a rabbit, the hair could be from a rabbit, it could be where the rabbit's only injured and have actually gone up close to it to put it out of its misery. But we will send it to the forensic laboratory at Huntingdon for them to carry out a proper examination of it. Just a day later, police were called to the farm once more. 
This time, the cousins had discovered a scratch on the mantelpiece in the kitchen. The relatives of Jeremy Bamba had uh, told the police that they discovered this mark and that it was related to uh, a silencer that they'd also found uh, in, the, in the farmhouse. Jeremy's cousins believed red flecks on the silencer could have been the result of a violent struggle in the kitchen where the gun came into contact with the mantle. Whilst this was examined, results on red particles in the silencer were reported back. The result came back with the fact that it was human blood on the silencer, inside the silencer, but not inside the rifle. This was a major turning point in the case. If traces of human blood were found, it suggested the device had to have been used for something other than killing animals. And the lab reports went even further. The blood inside the silencer was Sheila Caffell. I'm not sure if, they, if the laboratory were were 100% that it wasn't also a mixture of June and Neville's blood. But either way, it was certainly Sheila Caffell's. Forensics had found the enzyme AK1 in the particles and attributed it to Sheila Caffell. If her blood was on the silencer, police believed the whole case was different to what they originally thought. The silencer had to be on the rifle at the time when the shootings took place. Whoever did it, must have removed the silencer, put it back in the box, put it back in the cupboard. Now this, of course, put a whole different complexion on the inquiry because with the silencer fixed onto the rifle, laying across her body, had she shot herself, the gun now was too long for her to get her hand down to pull the trigger, to be resting under her chin. Couldn't be done, impossible. Police were originally convinced they were dealing with a murder-suicide. Now, a very different picture was being painted. As some officers investigated this new line of inquiry, the official verdict remained. Just nine days after the shootings, the bodies were released, and Jeremy Bamber laid some of his family to rest. He was inconsolable. He had his girlfriend Julie Mugford by his side and Colin Caffell, Sheila's estranged husband, by his other side. And it was, it was like something out of a movie. I remember looking at the photographs thinking there was a real power about the pictures. He did appear to be genuinely devastated. As the images of a broken family stunned the nation, officers continued with their inquiries and were soon to be rocked by yet another revelation. Jeremy Bamber's girlfriend at the time was a school teacher. Julie Magford. He lived in Goldhanger, or stayed in Goldhanger with him. There were other girls around, and uh, Jeremy enjoyed life, um, as he would say perhaps at the time. He said in the past that he wanted to kill them. It appears that early discussions with her, uh, Jeremy suggested he was going to carry out the murders himself. have reopened their investigation into the deaths of a family of five last month. Jeremy Bamber's immediate family have been brutally murdered in a violent attack at their farmhouse. Police believe Sheila Caffell, his sister, who suffers with schizophrenia, has killed her parents and sons before turning the gun on herself. But as Jeremy buries his loved ones and tries to cope with the grief, a sensational twist throws the whole case into turmoil. Jeremy Bamber's girlfriend at the time of the tragedies said he discussed ways of getting rid of the family, but I think the, the turning point for her, not only was her conscience getting the better of her, and she felt she had to come and unburden it to us, but I think she'd overheard him talking to an old flame on the phone at the time that they were going out together and felt a bit as though she was a jilted lover, as it were. And I think that certainly helped to be the turning point, which at the end of the day, was in the favour of the investigation. So her relationship had changed, and perhaps it wasn't quite what she hoped it was, so it appears that was the uh, catalyst for her going to the police to make her sensational allegations about him um, being behind the murders. Today was the day he was going to do it. Initially, I believe she said that he told her, tonight's the night. This startling revelation, along with the blood results from the silencer, 
gave the police two strong indications that Sheila Caffell may not have killed her family. Their attention quickly turned to Jeremy Bamber. The only person with any motive to kill all of that family, not rob the house, not burglarize the house, just to go in and kill a complete family, the only motive could have been the inheritance. And the only people that stood to inherit was Sheila Caffell and Jeremy Bamber. With Sheila Caffell out of the way, the only inheritor would be Jeremy Bamber. Bamber was privately educated and well known in the area for his adventurous lifestyle. Having traveled the world after leaving college, he eventually settled down to work full time in the family businesses, White House Farm and a nearby caravan park. Bamber's girlfriend at the time, Julie Mugford, claimed he had hired a hitman to carry out the murders. With her statement, and also the evidence found by the family, Detective Inspector Miller and his team were keen to turn the investigation round. Nick Ainsley, Sergeant Jones, myself, Taff Jones were in an office at Whitton Police Station. We related of what we'd got from Judy Mugford, and Mike Ainsley went round the, the circle of us, said, right, what do you think? Taff said, I'm sticking with what I've always said, that she's committed the murders and shot herself. He said to Stan Jones, what do you think? He said, well, I think Jeremy's done it. And he said to me, what do you think? And I said, well, this witness seems very plausible. As far as I was concerned, there was enough evidence to bring in and charge with the murders, Jeremy Bander, at that point. Officers believed Bamber could have entered the farmhouse through a small downstairs window, then travel back to his cottage in nearby Goldhanger before alerting police. There's a seawall from Goldhanger around to the farm. I think a bicycle ride to and from the scene would never have been seen in a million years. Certainly wouldn't take a car. Car headlights could have been seen coming around the village. By now, police felt the evidence against Bamber was mounting. During their investigations, he had left the country with a friend for a holiday. In his absence, police were also told that some flex on the silencer had originated from the mantle, confirming the family's theory that a violent struggle had taken place. On Bamba's return to the UK, officers were waiting to arrest him. Jeremy Bamber was interviewed and charged with five counts of murder on the 29th of September, 1985. He vehemently denied any involvement in his family's tragic deaths, stating he was at home when his father called, and that Julie Mugford had an axe to grind, having finished their relationship shortly after the murders. But Essex police had their evidence. Just over a year later, Bamber's high-profile court case began. Jeremy Bamber, the brother of model Sheila Caffell, has appeared in court charged with the murder of his parents, his sister and her twin sons. Mr. Bamber denied all the charges. Mr. Bamber, is it true? Your sister? The big moment was when he came into court. Gee. My recollection of him standing there being very polite, very attentive, not humble, but trying to portray this image of someone who was quite nice, charming, decent fellow. The key moment in the trial was Julia Mugford's testimony. Miss Mugford, why did it take you six weeks? Because the jury had to decide who was telling the truth, Julia or Jeremy. Didn't show much emotion. At times he seemed still a little bit amused by the proceedings. I suspect he really thought he was going to get off. Mm -hmm. Nothing yet, then. No further questions, Your Honour? The silence, sir. Evidence, yes, there it was. But that didn't have quite the emotional pull, emotional influence, that seeing this young girl in the dock uh, and having to adjudicate on her truth. Is it true, Miss Mugford, that your former boyfriend, Jamie Bamber, told you of his desire to kill his family? Please tell the court about the events of the night of the murders. It was like nothing I've ever experienced. There was a buzz. You could feel it in your stomach. You know, the court was packed, packed with journalists, packed with spectators. It was probably the most memorable day of my journalistic career. I therefore put it to you, Mr. Bamba, that it was you who 
Jeremy Bamber's trial lasted 19 days. In summing up, the judge outlined key points for the jury to consider. As part of his defense, he called or had read to you evidence to show that Sheila was mentally ill and argued that in her conduct in killing her family, it is entirely consistent with that illness. The red paint on the knurled end and the mark on the knurled end of the mantelpiece show that on that fact alone, that the silencer was on the gun during the fight in the kitchen. Members of the jury, have you reached a verdict? Yes, Your Honour, we have. The jury, by 10 to 2 majority, decided that he committed all the murders. And he was sentenced to five life sentences. Jeremy Bamber, the man who killed his family in order to inherit a fortune, has been sent to jail for at least 25 years. Justice Drake was the presiding judge and said you will serve a minimum of 25 years. You're a warped individual. You are evil beyond belief. Officers, take him away. As Bamba faced the rest of his life in prison, the scale and magnitude of this sensational case played out in a press frenzy. Despite the passing of time, this extraordinary crime rarely leaves the headlines for long. And now, over 20 years on, documentation from the investigation has come to light. New evidence that puts a twist on this heinous crime once more. Here, for the first time, we study the contents. On the morning of the tragedy, Jeremy Bamber was adamant there was movement within the farm. About, yes, two minutes past four of the house, something strange happened. Jeremy says they saw movement, a figure, a person moving in the upstairs room. They ran away, and certainly other police records confirm that they did run away. In addition to this, police telephone logs from the evening, state officers were in conversation with somebody inside the farm at 5.25 a.m. Armed response waited to enter the house until 7.37, over four hours after police arrived at the scene, and more than two hours after the conversation log. 7.37, they reported that in the kitchen were two dead bodies, one male, one female. That same message was picked up and recorded by two other sources. After discovering two bodies in the kitchen, all but one of the armed officers searched the rest of the house. At ten minutes past eight, they radioed three more bodies found upstairs. So initial inspection of the property reported two bodies downstairs and three upstairs. Yet by the time of Jeremy Bamber's trial, that had changed. The entire scene of crime presentation at Jeremy's trial and in witness statements should be there were four bodies upstairs. That's what they said. Something very strange had gone on. Dead bodies don't move. Five members of an affluent family have been brutally murdered in Essex. Police originally believed the daughter, Sheila Caffell, who suffered with mental illness, had killed her family and then herself. But in one of the most sensational twists in criminal history, the surviving relative, Jeremy Bamber, has been found guilty of the crime. Continually protesting his innocence, Bamber has spent over 25 years appealing his conviction. Now, vital documents from the investigation have surfaced after years of appealing by Bamba and his legal team. They reveal alarming contradictions in the case. One issue under scrutiny are differing accounts on the location of the bodies. The question arises as to where those bodies were because we have all this evidence that two bodies were downstairs and three upstairs, whereas the scene of crime evidence support and Jeremy's trial, and many other times, was that four were found upstairs. We have two dead females from bedroom. There are two young boys in here. Theories suggest that as the team of six armed officers moved through the house, something unexpected happened. There was a commotion, and one of the police officers, in his witness statement, refers to that. 
And his interpretation, or his explanation, is there was movement upstairs. What were the noises mentioned in the statement? The document goes on to suggest it could have been movement from another officer, that by the time other police attended the scene, four bodies, not three, were upstairs. The prosecution in the trial was resolute. Neville Bamber was discovered in the kitchen, the twins in their beds, and June and Sheila in the main bedroom upstairs. Some theories suggest Sheila moved from the kitchen up to the bedroom via one of the farm's three staircases, whilst the police were searching other areas of the house, having only injured herself with the first gunshot wound. Forensic photographs taken around 10 a.m. show Sheila's blood was still running from her wounds. Two statements also say this. Added to that, her body did not have liver mortis, suggesting she had not been dead for a long period of time. The prosecution claimed she would have died by 3.30 a.m., six and a half hours earlier. Jeremy had been outside with police since 3.45 that morning. Something had gone wrong. Why were the accounts so different? Further documents suggest the extended family found the silencer in the gun cupboard at a different time than originally thought. We find record of David Bouffler giving a silencer to the police on 11th of September. And the record in that particular log includes the statement that uh, he said he'd found it uh, in the cupboard. But other statements show a silencer was discovered almost a month earlier, on the 10th of August. The problem is, how and why did the second silencer appear? Because the prosecution case was so simple. There could only have been one. That's what they said. It's one they claim Sheila could not have shot herself with uh, if it was on the end of a rifle. Uh, but now we have, looking at September, a second silencer. So two documents show a silencer was collected on the 11th of September, but other family statements contradict these, saying one was found over a month earlier on the 10th of August. Which account is true? Were two silencers in fact found? There are two differing dates of discovery and two reference numbers given by police. Yet only one silencer was ever discussed at Jeremy's trial. Now, don't ask me what all this means. It does mean the reality is not what was produced at Jeremy's trial and helped secure his conviction. Records also reveal officers searched the gun cupboard shortly after the murders. The police had looked. They had carried out very thorough investigations and they had not found these items. A main element of the prosecution was that a silencer must have been on the murder weapon on the night of the killings. But Jeremy Bamber has always stated that this could not have been the case. From letters he has written during his appeal campaign, he believes there was never such a device on the gun. A .22 rifle is a low-caliber gun. Bamba also explains that even without a silencer, these make less noise when fired than other higher-caliber weapons. At trial, the jury was told that a silencer had been attached to the murder weapon, making it impossible for Jeremy's sister to have taken her own life. As for the issue of the silencer, Jeremy's defense team have conducted experiments. Prosecution alleged that Sheila's arms were too short and the gun plus silencer too long for her to have committed suicide. We now know that is not the case. We have the evidence and you can show it. The silencer sound moderator debate continues. It did form a large part of the trial in relation to the scratch discovered on the mantle. The prosecution made a great um, play on the evidence of the scratch mark uh, and how it implicated uh, Jeremy Bamber in the murders that took place uh, in the farmhouse. Now Peter Southurst, a photographic expert, has been given access to the crime scene images to analyse. On the original scene of crime pictures taken on the day of the incident, the uh, police photographer had not actually picked up that there was a scratch on the mantelpiece at all. The relatives of Jeremy Bamber had uh, told the police that they'd discovered this mark. 
The scratch mark itself was quite deep and would have produced a fair quantity of wooden paint which would have dropped onto the carpet if it had been there. So there's no sign of any um, debris at all in an area which I'd expect to see debris. Mr. Southurst has also made a startling discovery as to when the scratch mark was actually made. I was able to demonstrate using life-size pictures that the marks underneath the mantelpiece that I would have expected to see were not there, uh, and therefore the scratch had uh, been put there after the original scene of crime photographs had been taken. If we say that the, the scratch marks didn't appear on the original scene of crime, and therefore the silencer was not implicated in that, we can take the silencer out of the case altogether, and that alters the entire complexion of it. If the scratch was not on the mantel at the time of the murders, a large part of Jeremy Bamber's trial is flawed. The theory was that a violent struggle had taken place in the kitchen between Jeremy and his father. The silencer scratching the mantel in the process. The prosecution stated Sheila could not have fought with Neville Bamber. He would have simply overpowered her. Yet Neville was sat down when he died. Poor Neville eventually died sitting on a chair, leaning forward. <laughs> There's nothing in that tragic, ghastly picture that demands or refutes Sheila who, who did the deed. Also, the jury was told that the blood examined in the silencer was a mixture of human and animal. The human being Sheila's, with the presence of the enzyme AK1. Supporting the argument she could not have killed herself, then placed the device back in the gun cupboard. The blood that was found in the silencer, which allegedly was found in the gun cupboard two or three days after, had some blood deposited in it. They are totally inconclusive. Uh, there is no absolute forensic evidence. Science was used at all. The enzyme AK1 found by the forensic expert on the silencer and attributed to Sheila Caffell can in fact be found in dozens of animals, including rabbits. This was never outlined in the trial. Prior to the tragedy, Jeremy Bamber said his parents were trying to reason with his sister suggesting she received extra help with her twin boys. She wasn't really interested in, in any of the options. She didn't say a lot, and I didn't add a lot to the conversation while I was stood there. But we just didn't know how to reach out. With schizophrenia, it's really difficult, and our understanding of mental illness was very limited. Much more should have been made of the fact that Sheila, the day before the killings, was showing every sign of heading for uh, an episode uh, of paranoid schizophrenia. And that her psychiatrist said, given any hint that she was an adequate mother, she would flip it. And the defense didn't pursue that enough. You're not only telling me that I need to foster my own children! Statements from Sheila's psychiatrist reveal how he believed her mental state could have driven her to snap if faced with losing her children. Another crucial part of Jeremy Bamber's conviction was Julie Mugford's statement. She claimed Bamber had hired a hitman, but the man in question had a cast iron alibi. Shortly after the murders, Jeremy had ended his relationship with Julie. They had this enormous fallout, and we're talking about the last week in August, if I recall correctly. So hurt was Julie by the breakdown of their relationship, she admitted to officers that she tried to smother Jeremy with a pillow. It took one month after the murders for her to go to police with her story. She said that she was in anguish uh, and turmoil and distressed. But she appears to have acted a very ordinary life during August. Bamba's account of that fateful evening has never changed. Along with his father's distressed call to him in the early hours, he maintains Neville would have also made a call to police himself. Only Jeremy's call was discussed at his trial. Now, we're able to reveal this document. A phone call from Neville Bamber to police at 326 from White House Farm that states, daughter gone berserk and has got hold of one of my guns. The other log, 10 minutes later, is from Jeremy from his home in Goldhanger. Thousands of documents relating to the case have been placed under public interest immunity, never to be released by the police. Many a mailing family has the grief to bear. We there have presented to us a scenario wholly incompatible with the scene of crime evidence presented uh, at Jeremy's trial. And what we are now absolutely certain of 
is that Jeremy's conviction is not only unsustainable, but is wrong, that Jeremy Vember is an innocent man. I'm absolutely convinced, unequivocally, right man behind bars. The thought of those two little six-year-olds, you know, their lives just starting, being shot in such a calculating and terrible way, it's still upsetting now. Shortly after the massacre, Neville and June's extended family inherited the Bamber estate and the Eatons moved into White House Farm. The family stand by the original conviction and continue to make their voices heard in the media. If no one wins, we all lose. Can't bring them back. Jeremy Bamber has appealed his conviction since 1986, so far to no avail. He is one of only 35 prisoners in the UK to be given a whole life tariff. At present, he will die behind bars. It was a shocking crime in an area where there was very little or no crime. Two six-year-old boys and three adults were shot dead in cold blood. It was just ridiculously big, the story. It was just almost crazy. Officers believed Sheila Caffell had killed her family and then turned the gun on herself. But the twist that followed thrust this horrific crime into the headlines and turned the focus to her brother, Jeremy Bamber, a name that has gone down in the annals of British crime history. I don't think Britain had heard of a twist like it. And the twist continues. Is the right person behind bars? We look at vital new evidence that opens this case once more and makes this a crime that shook Britain. a.m. Chelmsford police in Essex receive a call from a local farmer, Jeremy Bamber, worried for his family's welfare. Jeremy Bamber had apparently received a phone call from his adoptive father to say that his sister, Sheila, Hello? had gone berserk in the house. You've got to come quickly. Dad? And had a gun. Dad, Dad! Jeremy Benber tried to call back, and he could not get through. In his state of anxiety, he wasn't sure, and who would be sure, whether it was engaged or off the hook, or whatever, but he couldn't get through. Jeremy phoned the local police station, and was advised to go to White House Farm, where he would find police officers waiting for him. The police rushed to the scene, and I think they spent quite a bit of time uh, waiting outside, as you would do if there's been a report of gunshots. Jeremy Bamber worked at his parents' farm, but lived just three miles away in Goldhanger. He arrived at the scene just minutes after the police. A conversation started. The police officers wanted to know about the house, who was in it, and what might be behind uh, the phone call. Bamber explained he had left the farm after work the previous evening. Officers decided not to enter until armed backup was at the scene. Police reinforcements were called and they were briefed. They were told there was a siege situation. Jeremy was asked to sketch a plan of the house for the firearms team. From the conversation with his father, it appeared Sheila, his sister, was threatening the family with a gun. 
At 7.35 a.m., almost four hours after police initially arrived, armed officers entered the sprawling 18th century farmhouse to be faced with a devastating scene. The father, Neville Bamber, was in the kitchen. He'd been shot there. The twins were in their beds. One certainly had been shot through the head and was still sucking his thumb. We had June out of her bed in the bedroom and Sheila, the adopted daughter, uh, laying there with a rifle, laying across a body with an open Bible alongside her. Sheila Caffell, her twin sons Nicholas and Daniel, and her parents, Neville and June Bamber, had been brutally murdered. Shot numerous times in cold blood, the only immediate surviving relative remained outside, Jeremy Bamber. Sergeant Jones and uh, DC Clark's job was, in that first instance, family welfare. Jeremy had been warned to expect the worst. We've been all around the place. Five fatalities. He had been driven back from, if you like, the front line of operations and was some hundreds of yards back. When the story was broken to him, he broke down.